Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. My name is Chris Martin, and I am the Associate Director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. And on behalf of my colleagues and co-organizers, I'd like to welcome you to our sixth of seven panels in this year's Queer Focus series. With generous sponsorship from the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies, as well as from peer regional centers throughout the US, this series is now in its fourth year, having previously centered on themes such as race, intersectionality, and decolonization. This year's series has been focusing on queer communities throughout Eastern Europe and Eurasia, and I invite you, our audience, to join all the panels taking place this semester. I'll post a link in the Zoom chat um, uh, after I'm done speaking with uh, details about our final session. All sessions will be live streamed and recorded for future reference in case you should miss any. This year's series was developed and executed by Emma Pratt and Alicia Baca at Ohio State Center for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and Jujana Magdo at the University of Pittsburgh Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. I'd also like to thank our institutional sponsors, including our peer regional study centers at the University of Kansas, the University of Michigan, the University of Texas at Austin, UNC Chapel Hill, Indiana University Bloomington, the George Washington University, the University of California, Berkeley, and Arizona State University. And last but not least, we extend our gratitude to the speakers for answering our call and stepping into this conversation, which is so critical for our field. Today's topic is queer focus on activism. And before I hand it over to our moderator, a bit of housekeeping, please use Zoom's Q&A function to post any questions for the speakers. Any questions that come in through our YouTube channel will also be shared with our moderator. So at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this session, Dr. Leosha Gorchkov. Leosha holds a PhD in political science from Perm State University. Leosha introduced queer studies to R Russian political science, actively promoting LGBTQA plus within Russian academia. In 2014, Russia was, uh, Leosha was forced to leave Russia uh, after being persecuted for being openly queer professor and advocating for LGBTQ rights. Yosha is now currently working at Coolgate University. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to many other posts, including serving as co-president and board member at Rusa LGBTQ, the Russian-speaking LGBTQ Association. He also served as a tenured faculty member at Perm State University prior to leaving Russia, as the care manager at the Alliance for Positive Change in New York, a visiting scholar at Indiana University, and the assistant director of the Pride Center and Women's Center at Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania. Leosha, thank you so much for shepherding, shepherding today's conversation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being at this call at this um, turmoil time and turbulent time in the across the globe, across the world, and especially within the uh, countries we are coming from. I just want to set the tone that uh, when we discuss preliminary, what we're going to uh, hear today, uh, we're going to just have that sense what the non-Western queer activism, LGBTQ plus activism looks like uh, in the countries which are not uh, typical Anglo-Saxon model. So we would like to uh, get the sense of the community and how people within those communities who are um, affected by the different, different conflicts, wars, uh, coexist and exist right now. And I'm very grateful that we have amazing panelists, which I will introduce and after that, give them the stage. So I'm going to introduce speakers uh, in order. We uh, would like to hear from them. The first uh, is Mahira Soyarkulova, is a queer feminist scholar, teacher and activist living and working in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. She has, has led the participatory action studies on lives of LGBTQ plus people in Kyrgyzstan, as well as research queer activism in South Caucasus uh, and Central Asia. She teaches courses on feminism, sexuality, activism, Ethics and Diversity and Art at IUCA, American University of Central Asia. Mahira also engages in activist, uh, activist artistic practices and community organizing. The second speaker is uh, Jana Arstikirbaeva, is a human rights activist, journalist, and poet, and the co-founder of Kazakhstan's LGBTQ plus feminist initiative, Feminita. The third speaker is Shota Kinchen, 
He's a journalist who works for OIC, uh, media, OIC Media, excuse me, a caucus-focused online media outlet. He's responsible for reporting on Georgia. Shota was involved in queer activism in the early 2010s, but later became increasingly critical of mainstream LGBTQI plus activism strategies. Shota Kinche was an independent blogger, freelancer, researcher, and invited lecturer at Belize State University and Ilya State University before joining the Social Justice Center at Belize-based human rights group and an ally of Georgia queer community community that helped raise awareness of queer rights among Georgians. Shota holds a master's degree in nationalism studies uh, from the University of Ed Edinburgh and interested in the intersection of gender and sexuality with Georgia far-right groups. He closely monitors local ultra-conservative movements within the context of a broader international anti-gender perspective, particularly the Western influence of Georgian anti-equality movements. And last but not, uh, not least, Tatiana Shurko, who I am very gladly to introduce because we participate together in one of the projects in Ukraine many, many years ago. Tatiana Shurko is a researcher and queer feminist activist from Belarus uh, committed to trans uh, transnational and intersectional feminist terrorizing activism. Her work is situated within anti-colonial feminist terrorizing with a focus on multiple imperialisms within the end between Europe, Eurasia and the United States. She has been awarded a 2023 American Council of Learned Society Fellowship. Her current research project focuses on critical genealogies of transnational feminism, specifically centering the connection between Black women, transnational activism, and Eurasian knowledge production. Specifically, her book project explores Black feminist solidarities in Eurasia, investigating how these interactions resonate with or may contribute to contemporary anti-imperialist feminist movements. She has taught a range of courses, include gender, sex, and power, Black women writers, health and inequality, sexualities and citizenship, and regulating bodies, global sexual economies. Without further ado, I would like to uh, give a stage to Mahira. Um, thank you, uh, Losha, and uh, um, thanks to the Data Center and all the organizers um, for bringing us together today. Um, I will um, use some slides, um, just uh, kind of uh, to have an to have some illustrations um, for the points that I'm going to be making. And um, in my remarks today, I'm going to be just responding to some of the preliminary questions we outlined for ourselves um, for today's discussion. Um, and I think they also feed quite well into the general um, discussions that have been uh, taking place in this series so far. Um, so uh, when we talk about um, queer, feminist, um, radical, progressivist, uh, however we want to call them, um, movement in um, uh, Central Asia, we are talking, um, of course, um, of the processes and phenomena that are taking place in the context of uh, uh, what uh, Essek and Kandakov have called the new sexual cold war. Um, and I find this um, a useful concept uh, because uh, it um, it kind of describes really well <laughs> what, what is happening um, in the past uh, decades um uh, in in the region and globally so um they um described this uh standoff that is happening between um the supposedly homophilic west or uh, in russian it's called gay europa and the homophobic east as the cold war for the 21st century um in and in this um standoff uh the internal um kind of diversity within these supposedly homogeneous units um, is completely erased. Yeah, the complexity, the um, the differences that exist um, within these blocks uh, become invisible. And of course, um, uh, it's important to remember how um, our region, just like the rest of the world, has been affected by a cascade of global crisis, uh, including the COVID pandemic, um, the um, conflicts that are taking place um, on international, regional, and, and um, domestic levels. Um, and But I'm primarily going to be speaking from my own experience as um, someone who lives and works in Kyrgyzstan. So most of my 
pretty much all my examples are um, coming from, from this experience. Um, so for us, then it's important to understand um, the more recent context uh, since um, 2020, after the so-called uh, third revolution in Kyrgyzstan and the coming of um, the two power you know, of this um, uh, tandem um, of Sadr Japarov and Kamjibek Tash Tashiev, uh, who um, have um, pretty much consolidated all the power in the executive branch and um, in the uh, secret services. And uh, there has been a consistent assault on all political opposition and dissent with uh, uh, journalists, uh, politicians, um, even uh, cultural uh, figures such as um, Akins, um, who are like traditional um, singers um, being put in prison, even for like posts in social media, etc. And we, of course, have the legislative context um, where um, uh, we have um, certain laws being adopted, such as the uh, so-called Protection of Children from Harmful Information um, Bill, um, which is similar to how the Russian gay propaganda legislation started. Uh, we also have this draft law on mass media. Um, in the process of being adopted, were also very repressive. And um, just yesterday, um, uh, the new law on so-called foreign representatives, um, which is similar to the Russia's foreign agents law, was adopted um, after the third reading. And now it's just up to the president to sign it into law. Um, and uh, all of this, of course, um, all these discourse that basically portrays this uh, standoff yeah um between uh, the west and the east is based on um the real justified grievances and fears um, that are themselves rooted in a global crisis of social reproduction so um you know all, all these populist kind of nationalist discourse about you know the threat to the survival of the kyrgyz nation um and um kind of resistance to uh, Western imperialism is articulated, um, but it doesn't um, basically call into question the capitalist um, system under uh, which we all exist. Um, so, um, yeah, so we know that also um, what's important is the um, what's happening in Russia, and we know that um, in the end of last year, Russia's Supreme Court uh, ruled that the international LGBT movement is an extremist, extremist organization. Um, and uh, oh, there's been this correspondence happening um, between um, the U.S. Um, Secretary of State and the Kyrgyz president, um, where the Blink, uh, Anthony Blinken um, expressed his concern about the um, adoption of the foreign agents law. And um, the response uh, from Sadr Japarov was to assert, assert again the kind of the sovereignty and independence of the Kyrgyz state. Um, um, so they, they um, yeah, um, they've been kind of um, uh, formulating this uh, um, idea of uh, Kyrgyz, um, yeah, basically resistance to this um, kind of undue interference into the internal affairs of um, the Kyrgyz Republic. So um, I've, I've recently participated in this um, study, as Lyosha mentioned, that looked at um, LGBT uh, movement building in South Caucasus and Central Asia. And one of our core research questions, um, things that we wondered ab about uh, during our research was, is there a movement to speak of in these regions, right? And our respondents were also very cautious in uh, referring to what they do as a movement. Um, they preferred the term activism, right? So, so like um, um, some of them said like, oh, when you say movement, you imagine that we're moving somewhere, but where are we moving? We're not moving anything. We are not moving ourselves. Um, and um Generally, when we say the word movement, well, this kind of idea is conjured of a 
kind of a teleological linear advancement uh, along some kind of um, error of time towards some progress. And um, of course, um, in terms of uh, temporal imaginations, uh, Central Asia is um, often imagined as kind of being uh, behind, yeah, and catching up to um, the supposed West. Um, so um, one of um, our respondents in this study used a metaphor um, of uh, kind of the nomadic movement. <laughs> um, so she says that, you know, um, in um, kind of the nomadic uh, cultures, there's different visions of futurity, which don't necessarily um, presuppose um, a linear movement. Um, um, so, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I thought this was um, an interesting kind of um, metaphor. Um, so, um, yeah, so when we're talking about um, decolonizing uh, queer activism, there has been um, this attempt in, in this context of like referring to ac uh, queer activism as kind of a foreign agency. Um, so there's been a reaction on, on the part of the activists to sort of um, prove that, uh, no, we are not foreign agents, we, and, and to kind of um, create some counter narratives and also to appropriate this kind of national symbols and um, kind of to um, join themselves into this um, uh, discourse of, um, yeah, basically nationhood. Um, uh, but I wanted to also give some examples from um, my own kind of involvement and um, some of the, um, I guess, um, activism that I've, I've been involved with um, to show how um, there's the, 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 there's possibility for a, a different path, right? So there's, it's not just kind of uh, either being a foreign agent um, or... Um, kind of um, trying to uh, normalize uh, queer people as proper Central Asian, you know, like true Central Asian. So um, uh, a while ago, um, I think in 2016, I um, translated um, uh, the uh, Queer Nation Manifesto into Russian. Um, and so then I reflected also on my um, experience because there was another translation by um, a, a Russian group who uh, offered a different interpretation of the the word queer, um, and so um, I, I kind of tried to reflect then on um, how do we translate queer because uh, this word doesn't have the same history, and uh, uh, some activists have argued it doesn't have the same kind of emancipatory potential when just simply transferred into our um, context. So, um, yeah, so uh, we've been um, discussing that for a while in, in, in this part of the world. So then um, we started thinking that maybe this um, word tema, which is kind of the, um, the kind of the Soviet and post-Soviet way of queer people referring to themselves, like non-heterosexual, non-gender conform conforming people of describing the experience and um, um, we even had like this um, this symposium also in uh, 2019, which was called Ftemi, uh, um, which means in the know um, on sex, politics and life of LGBT people in Central Asia. And um, yeah, so uh, uh, we were also then trying to kind of um, appropriate this term um, and uh, yeah, kind of... Uh, uh, think about um, can 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 tema can tema be like our version of queer, um, and then uh, yeah. So um, um, earlier um, there were also attempts by activists um, who worked um, in uh, Stab, which was an organization uh, in Bishkek. Also, it stands for uh, School of Theory and Activism Bishkek. Um, the artistic directors, um, Georgi Mamedov and Aksana Shatalova, um, as part of this bigger project about utopian histories of Bishkek city, um, created this um, imagination 
of a queer commune that um, could have existed or should have existed in uh, Soviet Frunze in the 1970s, right? And so they used kind of a mixture of real and uh, fabricated um, documents uh, to, yeah, imagine a different past. Um, um, so uh, that's also kind of a way to think um, about Soviet um, in a different way, because a lot of the conversations um, currently uh, about decoloni decolonizing activism uh, in this part of the world um, kind of completely reject the Soviet experience, right? So then um, decolonization sort of becomes this also um, uh, the rejection of the, <laughs> the socialism as a, as a kind of project. Um, then... Um, uh, also kind of thinking about our own um, creating our own queer, queer cultures and, and um, um, queer histories um, there was an attempt also to uh, create um, a symbol for the local movement and also a date of, of celebration of the um, queer movement uh, it was proposed that the 8th of April would be celebrated um, um, to kind of uh, yeah because then uh, it's not just another kind of international date. Um, and um, yeah, so like this uh, symbol of the white square was chosen. And the history to that is that the activists um, made some um, stencils uh, all over the city, on the fences, on the pavements. Uh, which said uh, things like tenderness is not propaganda. So this was, I think, also in response to the uh, uh, propaganda draft law being proposed in Kyrgyzstan. And um, yeah, so there were like uh, phrases like uh, we exist um, and things like that. And then the municipal services, they just painted over them with white paint. So especially those that were on the pavements, they were painted over with white paint. And um, this um, shape of the white square was created. So this was also an attempt to kind of um, create um, this kind of new symbolism and again, like um, creating a local uh, history of the movement. Um, now, um, uh, also something I've been involved in is um, organizing the um, Women's March for the 8th of March. So the the uh, celebration of the 8th of March um, um, has been also the center of <laughs> political controversy. So you can see the, the uh, photographs from different years. Um, and each year was kind of um, marked by some confrontation around important symbols. So in uh, 2019, it was um, the presence of the... Uh, Sorry, my dear, I have to interrupt you. We have one minute mark okay. here. Thank you. Yeah. So, so basically, um, yeah. So, uh, uh, the uh, Women's Day um, kind of also became this locus of a locus of contention, and we can discuss that um, also. I think Shanar is going to talk about the eighth of March struggles in in Kazakhstan, um, and yeah. So, we also have uh, tried to um, uh, talk about happiness as a project, as a leftist, as a queer feminist project. Um, in our activism and also imagine alternative um, futures. So these are uh, this is um, the cover of the book uh, of uh, feminist and queer science fiction that Janar has also published a story in um, and, and myself. Um, and yeah, so it was all the kind of activists from post-Soviet space trying to imagine a different future. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess my main um, message in response to this uh, discussion of um, what what would decolonizing uh, queer activism for us look like? I think it's very important to move beyond just kind of the surface level, just symbolic or performative aspects of decolonization, and think more about um, the political economy, um, and yeah, also understand kind of ourselves um, in the context of the global. Um, systems of oppression. And yeah, I'm looking forward to what um, Tanya is going to talk about in, in, in her part of the discussion. So thank you very much. Um, and um, yeah.
um, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mahir. Thank you very much. And you already kind of made a bridge to Janar. Janar, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I will speak. Uh, I am here at the big conference, so sorry if some noise would come uh, because I'm in a room and while the break is happening. I'm very happy to be here with you and thank for Davis Center, for Dosha, for everybody uh, to join. It's very important we share our experiences um, and our struggle. So I would like to speak about our activism in Kazakhstan. So as Feminita, we started as LBUQ uh, initiative uh, since 2014. And we started from the, you know, very uh, usual um, civil protest against devaluation of Kazakhstani national tingye. So it uh, it was like we didn't foresee that uh, that moment would become a turning point for, for doing our uh, next uh, LBQT activism. So we started in 2014, and for us it was very important that we um, we taking in the team and we presenting ourselves as LBQ women, and then we started to be allies to transgender initiatives. That is why we always say LBQT women. And this picture, this uh, how to say the the uh, content of the team is still uh, is still like that LBQT women. Um, um, here I'm coming to the point of criticism of gay activism, uh, which in Kazakhstan I do not see. So gay uh, individuals, uh, actors, actually, they do social entrepreneurship, which, of course, I really appreciate. We do need uh, clubs uh, for dance, uh, you know, to hang out. But what we see, we do not uh, see them, like, you know, too much in comparing or too much solidarizing with grassroots activism when we go at streets, for example, or face the police, or face the digital surveillance, or face physical attacks. This is the point where gay activists look like somewhere disappeared. That is why I always have this critical point that in Kazakhstan, these are lesbians, bisexual, queer and trans women who go in forefront who fighting, who struggling, and who facing the violence. And I'm criticizing gay activists because we do not see too much solidarity, even if we are organizing another event that uh, look uh, much more safe. For example, 8 of March meetings and demonstrations. In 2021, we had historically first allowed uh, by the local administration. So in Kazakhstan, uh, the law says you have to just apply, you just send the application. But in practice, you have to have a permission. So in 2021, we had the permission from local administration, Akimat, for the first time ever in Kazakhstan, have 8th of March demonstration. We uh, marched a long way, like about five kilometers. And it was really historical celebration on women's rights. Uh, we had very great topic uh, activism of the uh, variety groups uh, of very various groups of women in Kazakhstan. It was really good topic when uh, where we all could speak from the stage. But uh, on that point, on 2021, uh, 2021 uh, this is, was uh, the beginning and the end of the allowed uh, meetings for feminists, activists, L LBQT women. Because in 2022, if you remember, we had Panda Kantar, the bloody January events, which our government accepted as something very aligned. Uh, so they couldn't understand, oh, this is Kazakh people who are very poor. That is why they came to streets. That is why they came to square and started to protest. And yes, of course, beat some uh, window, beat some uh, shops because they wanted to take iPhone or phones or to take shoes. This is why they were angry, because they didn't see salary, they do not see any benefits in Kazakhstan. That is why they took some needs, some products that they uh, need, first of all. It was shoes. So our president called uh, Kazakh male uh, people who actually were portrayed on this uh, Kantar as terrorists, so he, uh, he called them terrorists. 20,000 people of Kazakhstan became immediately terrorists in Kandakantar. 
only because they went to street, they went to square and protested. Of course, they did not protest politely because government always think that maybe people should protest politely to say, please, can you give our rights? Uh, please, can you implement something else? No. If people angry, they will do beat window, building, they will fight back. This is, uh, this is what happened in Kazakhstan. So because of this kantar, the local administration in many cities has an image that if we allow to feminists uh, demonstration, public demonstration, rally, they will give us again second kantar or third kantar. This was the fear. They were very scared that we will march and we will attract a lot of people, you know, and this would become in some kind of uh, not peaceful gathering, but maybe a little bit not peaceful gathering. So from the 2021, we didn't have any uh, ability to go and uh, actually publicly um, uh, march, walk together with sister and sister, with sister and brothers, with sister and other creatures of the planet Earth. So um, it was very sad because in 2023, we applied more than 20 applications we sent to local administration, more than 20 from the November of 2020 to. Uh, for the March and meeting in 2024, we applied for more than 30 applications to have peaceful uh, demonstration and uh, meeting. And also we have denials. So local administrations uh, really scared because not it happened not only in Almaty, in Astana, uh, they behave same. They said it is not possible because feminist march and meetings are the threat to public order. Uh, yes, yes, this is a citation. Uh, you can cite it for your future researchers. Feminist march and meetings are the threat for public order. Not femicide that we have in Kazakhstan, not discrimination of LBQT people, not the gender gap in salary, uh, not the social protection, uh, poor social protection of women in Kazakhstan, but feminist marching meetings are the threat to public order. This made us so angry that we started to, un to ask and request, can you explain how we became threat? So, and we were luckily uh, through the journalist, uh, Nazgul Jarbulova, who sent the official request from the media and Akimat answered finally. So the threat means that feminist march and meetings are propagating uh, alien uh, values, Western values, and like it's very ha rarely happened in history of Kazakhstan and LGBT. It is written in the text of the request, uh, in the answer of the to the request, answer of local uh, administration. It's very ha rare happily in Kazakhstan where officials write to you the direct cause and name LGBT as LGBT. So we have it in the denial. So it is not because we are afraid to public order, it is because we are LGBT. So feminist march and meetings are uh, propagating LGBT uh, values, issues, and so on. Although we have topic, Svoboda i Bezapasnis Kazakhstanskich Zhenshin. So the freedom and uh, safety of Kazakhstani women. Because we were really touched and shocked by the femicide case in 2023 with Sultanat Nukienova. She was murdered by her husband. And husband uh, was a very high official. Uh, he was like in the ministries and he was, um, uh, how to say, um, uh, he was planning it, planning it intentionally. And video registrators uh, actually uh, filmed the, the murder itself. Uh, so uh, now we have a uh, court trials, actually, and uh, he did not uh, uh, how to say he did not said that he confessed that he is guilty. So now he tries to to uh, this case to be uh, in the arbitrary uh, court in Kazakhstan. So uh, maybe I'm a little bit wrong in English. So I also have to mention anti-gender movement, uh, which are very active uh, in uh, not only in Kazakhstan, but also in Central Asia. Recently, we finished um, our research on anti-gender movement or individuals, anti-gender individuals in uh, Central Asia. We uh, included Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. 
So the results would be published probably in April because now we are re-editing, we are proofreading, uh, finalizing some parts. So it would be, I think, in the open uh, resource. So you you can, uh, any of you, if you're interested, of course, you can read and share. So what is very interesting there that we found uh, uh, on the case of Kazakhstan, the connection to Russian anti-gender movement, uh, even in the visual that they share with each other, uh, for example, how videos should uh, film, uh, right? Or how posts uh, should be taken and put into Instagram or in TikTok. So even that kind of format, uh, they have a special, um, uh, how to say, standard form for that kind of messages. They become popular in Kazakhstan because of actually COVID, uh, uh, COVID uh, epidemic, uh, because anti-gender activists started to organize their own organization, which expressed doubt to the government of Kazakhstan. So that was a bridge to, to come into uh, too big a population of Kazakhstan and say, we will not agree with your politics regarding COVID and prophylactics and uh, prevention of COVID. So that is why a lot of people came to them and now they are really big numbers. Uh, there are a lot of activists who support them. After this anti-vaccination, um, uh, so they put uh, attention to that, but of course they spread anti-vaccination agenda. Of course, they do not believe in science, just imagine. So they started putting comma and said, oh, actually we are against the law on domestic violence. So they put that to agenda and they added also anti-LGBT and anti-women's rights uh, rhetorics. So now it's not just the only one anti-scientific uh, arguments uh, organization which spread, uh, uh, yes, very contradictive uh, <laughs> theories about uh, any kind of vaccination. But also it is very anti-LGBT, very anti-women's rights, very... Um, anti-child rights uh, protection uh, arguments and theories that they spread and they are very big so no, sorry, I, to, I wanted to say we have one minute left yeah. uh, okay okay uh, so uh, what else i would like to i also agree with Ma mohira that uh, our decolonial, decolonial activism should not only take the the some kind of only two stages maybe that uh, everybody could agree uh, for example, we uh, started to pay attention more to Kazakh language and we post and do our lectures and seminars and uh, projects, feminist picnics and uh, Purple Youth, all the projects started to be in Kazakh. But it is also, we have to go further and understand what we really mean on decolonization, what we should, you know, um, uh, put as a purpose of, of the decolonization, because we still have discussions. Uh, uh, where we have to go now, because uh, yes, now we speak in Kazakh, we provide every lecture in Kazakh in, uh, language first, rather than Russian, but what else we have to do? So I think it's still open discussion and um, I, I hope my colleagues also could elaborate on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Janar, very much. Shota, it's your floor. Thank you. Um, so, uh... Speaking about decolonizing activism, queer activism in Georgia is extremely difficult task um, because for several reasons, but also because of the activist agenda is uh, quite uh, you know, westernized and fully uh, focused on the West and support and solidarity coming from the West, not so much from other regions, uh, including neighboring regions, which, um, which is something we could talk about or think about. Um, so Georgia is a case, is a strange case, because on the one hand, um, Georgia has a very progressive anti-discrimination laws, uh, laws against discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, but also it's a case uh, where social public views, social attitudes on um, queer sexuality has not improved much. I mean, it's debatable. Um, people interpret numbers in different ways. Optimists see uh, the bright side and pessimists the other side. But um, I mean, it hasn't been uh, uh, as 
improvement as uh, it was anticipated. Uh, so the trend is positive, but <clears throat> there's a big disappointment. Um, and uh, I mean, um, I got involved in uh, activism in uh, 2010, 11, uh, and there was this very strong urge to hold the very first, uh, no one was daring to say gay pride or march, like the first pro-queer rights public demonstration um, in Tbilisi, obviously. Um, and um, it it was coming from a strong sense that we should be visible, uh, uh, that the visibility should grow and we should speak for ourselves. Uh, but like looking back now, um, we ended up with different reality, like uh, Ironically, we might have misinterpreted or misunderstood visibility because we ended up with the visibility of uh, the topic, the issues, so to say, um, while we don't have many publicly out and outspoken queer people advocating for their rights, speaking uh, uh, in first, I mean, like speaking about themselves and how the system oppressive is, how it influences their lives. And uh, unfortunately, it uh, sometimes it happens when uh, queer uh, Georgians have to flee the country and take uh, refuge in uh, European countries. So it's a very sensitive topic that uh, uh, this reality. And um, so, <clears throat> in the first years of the activism, uh, I, I saw um, a big problem in uh, in this male-dominated gay activism, frankly, to hold the very first queer march in history of Georgia. And it was like a weird zeal to enter, to write the history and be in it. And it was like, it kind of became a bit toxic. Obviously, I'm not talking about the state's failure to secure um, attempts of queer uh, uh, marches and how terrible they've been. I, I'll, I'll be mostly focusing on what we could have done differently to, you know, like avoid avoid backlash, avoid government, church, uh, far right groups being uh, effective in like boiling this backlash, uh, pushback um, against queer equality. Um, so the biggest problem which still persists, I think, is that uh, locally in, in local Georgian queer activism, I mean, num our numbers are growing or out, but there is still a problem of like uh, positioning yourself as a supporter, as an ally, especially in early years. It's, it's I mean, it's, it's been improving, but... And uh, this kind of visibility, when you are not able to articulate that I'm gay, I'm lesbian, I'm transgender person, and I have problems, and we should talk about it. And when you instead have to resort to position yourself as an ally, as a general support of queer rights, it ended up being quite demoralizing, like radiating shyness or shame or weakness in public relations. Uh, terms and like uh, it 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 wasn't very effective and um the most the biggest problem we ended up is uh, like lack of community empowerment actually so when uh, when 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 there is no big uh, a lot of resources de dedicated to medical um services uh, providing legal services um uh, educational um programs, uh, especially working with parents, which I think is like extremely important in Georgia. And I, I, I think in post-Soviet uh, region, working with parents so that they become your uh, supporters. Like neglecting stuff like this is deeply consequential. And um, when you don't have strong uh, empowered community, then you end up mostly with a movement uh, dictated by allies, by liberal allies. And it has some problems. So that is like a big topic, but the main problem is uh, you're not strong enough to influence agenda, to have your own agenda, and you're mostly dependent on liberal groups speaking in your name because you just can't 
a lot of people just can't speak for themselves. And there was a kind of, to, to use dramatic term, it's, it was some kind of a hijacking of queer agenda uh, by local liberal elites. Um, uh, also, like, um, the, there is some um, acute problem of grounding your demands uh, into local reality. I'm going to give you like a quick example. Like probably everybody remembers like uh, 2013 uh, uh, homophobic riots in Tbilisi, and like like pictures were dramatic. There was a large homophobic riots, uh, and like people went after much smaller. A uh, group of queer activists who wanted to hold to, to mark uh, International Day against homophobia, um, and we, uh, when we wanted visibility, we obviously talk uh, like started to think about uh, queer march, public march, uh, but it was also um, the period when, in public imagination, um, homosexual contact generally and queer sexuality was strongly linked with state-sanctioned uh, sexual violence. Um, for instance, the first March attempt was several months after there was a big scandal of prison torture when prison inmates who became victim and were depicted uh, to be victims of uh, uh, guard abuse. Um, so obviously it's an absurd to link this, but in public imagination, in public perception, there was some, some, some sort of collective trauma that this topic was associated with violence. And I'm not claiming we could have solved this and unleak the association, but the very fact that we didn't even think about this issue, or for instance, we didn't even advocate for the victims of sexual torture, for the compensations, for provision of legal services, uh, stuff like this, mm -hmm. uh, like it, it points out in ret retrospect um, at our naivety, like that we, we were focused on very Western concepts while ignoring uh, local realities, um, and like another big problem um, beyond like weak. Uh, community, like lack of community empowerment. Another big problem is the geopolitization of uh, um, queer rights and equality generally. Um, in Georgia, it's been especially uh, easy because uh, um, like not being, being against homophobia or not being homophobic uh, was always uh, like linked to, with being progressive um, and uh, Pro Western, and it like it in it made it easier to delegitimize far right initiatives because they were at least perceived as pro Russia. But this is slowly changing. This had been changing within among far right groups, but now it's the government doing actually doing that and rebrand rebranding, selling uh, conservative initiatives like. Uh, the law against uh, LGBT propaganda, which we are anticipating now, uh, as a very Western, uh, Hungarian, maybe um, copy paste. And in fact, the challenge is that uh, it could be a, a, actually a copy paste of uh, urban uh, law. Uh, so uh, this articulation that, oh, this is like a Russian influence, it has some limits, especially as far right far right groups in Georgia are mutating and the evolution is going towards the, uh, towards the direction of westernizing their messages. And it, it, it is becoming another big challenge uh, locally. So I don't have like specific good examples of like identifying like queer historical figures or symbols or changing language much. But I think the biggest challenge is that like grounding and localizing uh, your demands and ideas to and stay grounded in the local reality. That's my proposition. I'm gonna stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Throta. Thank you very much. And now we are moving to Tatiana. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to be together with these wonderful people <laughs> and have my humble contribution. 
And I probably will focus more on the ruses or difficulties of transnational solidarity that actually experiences similar issues that many local activists experience when we are caught in binaries. And also trying to understand, um, not thinking beyond them, but trying to choose the sides. And it affects uh, the impact um, and influence of transnational solidarity. Um, so if you think, for example, about the recent homophobic state regulations in Russia and several and in several former Soviet republics, and Mahira already mentioned, for example, one in Kyrgyzstan, um, they highlight the ongoing state violence based on gender and sexuality. Um, for instance, as if following Russia's case, Belarus has recently proposed a law banning the promotion of non-traditional relations, including sex change and voluntary refusal of childbirth. So even child-free uh, ideas um, can become pro prohibited. If enacted, this law could lead to increased political persecution of politically active Belarusians associated with queer communities or engaged in reproductive or gender justice advocacy. This occurs against a backdrop of ongoing discrimination and physical violence against queer individuals in Belarus and, of course, the general persecution of many politically active people. Additionally, such laws serve as means for some authoritarian leaders to demonstrate allegiance to Russia, perpetuating the legacies of Russian imperialism. Moreover, these regulations contribute to the formation of conservative alliances with white supremacist forces in the West as well, reinforcing borders against the perceived threat of otherness. And we can see the rise of homophobic and transphobic laws in the US, for example, against the background of collaboration between supremacists across the borders. These laws have gotten global attention due to the alarming levels of violence experienced by many queer individuals, highlighting the use of gender and sexuality as grounds for severe brutality and dehumanization. However, I propose that these instances of violence expose the enduring nature of imperial violence where gender and sexuality serve as a foundation for its seamless operation. Solely concentrating on patriarchy might not fully capture the intricate factors contributing to sexual violence within the broader context of imperialism. Simultaneously emphasizing the intersection between imperial and sexual violence is crucial for comprehending the essence of Russian imperialism and building transnational solidarities. For instance, we can think about the example of persecution of LGBTQ people in Chechnya since 2017 that have garnered wide transnational attention. Expressions and appeals for solidarity from various Western and Russian human rights, LGBTQ and feminist actors and organizations primarily center on sexuality as a sole axis of oppression. However, this focus often overlooks crucial dimensions about Russian imperialism, racism and colonial warfare, which historically uh, and presently contribute to the violence in Chechnya and actually in many other Eurasian borderlands. The solidarity calls uh, prioritize the vulnerability experienced by specific communities that appear to align more with Western notions of sexual diversity, neglecting the role of imperial and racial violence in perpetuating this vulnerability and creating conditions that face many that force many others to flee their country. To provide more context to the statements, um, I need to say that the relationship of the Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union with global coloniality is evident not only in the physical colonization of different borderlands, but also in the epistemic colonization of these territories by Eurocentric discourses of modernization and gendered regimes of ethnic and racial difference. The establishment of Russian rule over diverse territories has been driven by supremacist, racist, and patriarchal ideologies manifested in racialized cultural images and violent politics. The Soviet Union in this regard, unfortunately, did not differ significantly and continued the legacies of Russian imperialism. For example, Dan Healy emphasizes that Russian chauvinism and European anxiety anxieties jointly shape the Soviet legal stance on homosexuality. The construction of backward traditions or perverse practices served as tools for civilizing mission, justifying occupation. 
gender expensive individuals were particularly targeted by Soviet authorities, erasing variant practices and expression popular in non-Western contexts. Continuous military interventions at the same time disrupted local economic and communal structures, impacting land ownership, political institutions, and social hierarchies. The enduring warfare driven by imposed ideas of progress has disrupted local gender relations, intimate practices, kinship systems, administrations, and responsibilities. They also inhibited the agency of communities to bring about changes through intercommunal relations. The collapse of the Soviet Union didn't dismantle these colonial legacies. Instead, it triggered economic and political crisis leading to a reformation of social relations and the emergence of new sites of vulnerability and dependency. Systemic violence is not a new phenomenon. Rather, the collapse of the Soviet Union resulted in the reworking of old racial and colonial frameworks and the restructuring of new forms of global relations. However, the normative narrative of gender violence deprioritized feminist economic analysis, and Mahir already mentioned the <laughs> importance of this political analysis, political economic analysis, and overshadowed the continuities and persistence of imperial violence. In the context of contemporary, for example, warfare uh, in the region, the multiple military interventions, they normalized violence, particularly affecting women and gender expansive individuals. This disruption has led to economic challenges and reshaped the division of gender labor and communal relationships with the land. Furthermore, warfare has separated men from their communities and relationships, conscripting them into the military chain of command. This comes with a certain expectations and ideas of masculinity. The implementation of imperial strategies has facilitated the development of militarized masculinities within both the colonizer and the colonized societies. Meanwhile, alternative or marginalized forms of masculinity face displacement or threat, resulting in significant transformations in gender and sexuality dynamics within the community. The hardships of war dominated by militarized masculinities disproportionately burden women and gender expansive individuals. They are tasked with caring for family members and neighbors while also becoming targets of detention, torture, violence, disappearances, and killings. Instances of gender-based and sexual violence are often attributed to the post-Soviet, so-called post-Soviet turn toward traditionalism. However, the profound influence of imperialism, the establishment of Russian rule and warfare um, on gender and sexual norms, as well as contemporary politics and narratives, is frequently overlooked or disregarded. For example, while Russia's imperialist interventions have influenced gender relations in the region, um, for example, if we talk about the Chechnya, it has also constructed Chechnya as inherently homophobic, patriarchal, and prone to violence. Simultaneously, Russia has embraced so-called anti-LGBTQ laws as part of its support for traditional values, including Christianity, as a fundamental aspect of ethnic Russian identity. Unexpectedly, while opposing state attacks on sexual rights, some LGBTQ scholars and activists in Russia have also discussed the persecution of queer people in Chechnya through the prism of conservatives and homophobia as inherent features of Chechen traditional culture. At the same time, also many LGBTQ individuals from different Eurasian borderlands can seek asylum in Western Europe or the US, for example, based on their sexuality. Fair treatment within the refugee system, camps and facilities is not guaranteed. Specifically, many queer refugees from Chechnya still face racial violence in Western Europe, mirroring the experiences in Russia. Simply opening up the borders for LGBTQ refugees doesn't challenge the violent migration policies that keep European borders closed to other refugees, subjecting many to unbearable conditions within the refugee detention system. In this context, Western solidarity with LGBTQ individuals um, in Chechnya or other Eurasian borderlands, while driven by the intention to protect and offer political support to vulnerable groups, allows the West to maintain its self-image as a bastion of freedom, but only for select subjects to join this freedom archipelago. 
Transnational feminist solidarity, queer solidarity, should intertwine the analysis of gender and sexual oppression with the critique of racism, colonialism, and nationalist militarism. This focus necessarily involves grappling with gender and sexuality as tools of coloniality and raises questions about Eurocentrism together with Russian centrism. The example of Chechen queers illuminates the dire and urgent need to recognize the interdependency among multiple systems of domination and how identities of race, race, class, and gender can either enhance or diminish the marginalization of LGBTQ individuals. Expressing solidarity with LGBTQ people from Eurasian borderlands requires acknowledging how structures and relations shaped by Colonial regimes impact gender and sexual relations, affecting all members of native society. True liberation for LGBTQ individuals demands not just addressing homophobia, but dismantling the political economic system influenced and fueled by imperialism and militarism. And in this sense, I want to say that gender violence is not just an affect or uh, a side project of the empire. It's actually a core project of the empire. And all institutions reinforce it again and again through different mechanisms. Thus, current state projects that utilize gender, sexuality, and race to ethnicity, to engineer the nation and control discourses of social difference, illuminate the lingering effects of colonial relations. Historically, gender and sexuality were tools of domination through which ethnic, religi religious, and culturally so-called backward others were subjected to the civilizing mission of the empire. Today, we witness the continuation of these logics in new contexts and conditions, yet it's still aiming to expand power. In this context, I refer to both imperial formations, Russian and Western, for which gender and sexual politics serve the goal of safeguarding the borders. For example, uh, scholar Piro Rekzepi analyzes the colonial logics behind uh, okay, European... Yeah, I, I want to interrupt, we have one minute left. Yeah, yeah I have just a couple of sentences. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to bring example of Piro Rekzepi, who emphasizes that the US U European Union sports sponsored discourses for queer rights in Kosovo, for example, um, they lead to the recognition of queer rights, but also sideline, for example, the hardships of queer Muslims. Uh, the Ukrainian scholar Lesa Pagulic also emphasizes how uh, between liberal, like this link between liberal gay rights discourses and the production of narratives of progress in Ukraine also erases uh, experiences of many uh, of many queer communities that do not fit the norm of uh, whiteness, for example. And I mean, for example, queer Roma people who do not... Um, uh, visible in the struggles for LGBTQ rights. So this complex approach can help us to develop a more insightful critique of imp both imperialism and um, anti-gender violence and LGBTQ violence. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Sorry you, it took you. me so long. Oh, no, no. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, uh, everyone. I would like to open, I guess, the floor for questions. I don't know if we have, so far I don't see anything in the chat, but if you have your question, please, submit because it's a lot to process and a lot of to, uh, I guess, reflect on considering that it's non-typical, non-Western context. And I uh, literally urge all of us to think about that, whatever we are right now. And some of our uh, panelists mentioned that uh, what's going on right now in the United States is a very concern, for example, across the board in the more than 20 states. And uh, sometimes it reminds me of the copycat and the legislation of those evil empire like Russia, for example, right? So uh, if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, otherwise, if uh, you, dear panelists, have questions to each other, you're also welcome to jump. Uh, I don't want to deprive you from that opportunity to um, discuss amongst yourself as well something. Because I have taken a lot of notes, but I don't want to <laughs> ask before people in the audience. Yeah, if I may, just uh, on the point of copycat laws, um, so this um, foreign agent law um, or in response of uh, President Japarov to uh, U.S. State Secretary, he says it's actually modeled after the um, American law, uh, which was introduced in the post-war years. Yeah, um, and uh, the same can be said about the gay propaganda law, which is also modeled under 
the British law that existed, yeah, in the 80s, and um, was then also um, pretty much um, uh, uh, kind of uh, there's an, an alliance of like American evangelists and uh, right-wing politicians going around the world and um, basically um, pushing this legislation through various parliaments across the world, in Uganda, in you know, in Kyrgyzstan, um, like the, the, this kind of documented um, uh, track of, of, of that happening. So it's it's very much part of this global politics. It's not uh, just the kind of the idiosyncratic um, <laughs> nature of yeah, uh, what what Tatiana was talking about. It's not like this homophobia that is inherent in specific localities. It's part of global politics. Thank you, Mahira. That's exactly uh, what I was thinking, and you're absolutely right, because if we uh, look through the history of formation of homophobia, institutionalized homophobia coming from the Western world with the conquest, right, when the uh, Spanish conquistadors came to the um, South America and uh, deprived them from their own authentic selves. What I want to ask you, um, I have a very interesting question. I know we don't have all the remedies and the answers, but do you think there is a hope? Uh, and I know we all the in the United States, the world hope is now everywhere. But in your continuums, in your localities, do you think there is any hope or any strategy how we can sustain the community and how you sustain as activists and researchers and intellectuals, uh, how you take care of yourselves within all of that? So what is your tactics and strategies? I know, I ask very complicated question. So, um, yeah, uh, I, 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 we were recently at a regional meeting uh, with also um, some people from the Caucasus. Um, and um, we were discussing how it's looking very grim for activism in Central Asia at the moment. And um, it's likely that the existing registered LGBT organizations are going to like reformat their activities in some significant ways in the light of the adoption of this um, foreign agents law. And uh, we were discussing how uh, we don't really have links with um, you know, uh, activists in the Middle East, um, and we should <laughs> have links with, like, you know, people working in um, Iran and um, in, uh, you know, like, really oppressive contexts, um, because uh, they've been somehow surviving and um, hopefully maintaining community and, you know, maintaining some sense of hope um, through a lot of hardship and yeah we will we will need to learn from them and we will also um yeah perhaps uh, it will be some kind of uh also uh, decolonial <laughs> um uh kind of collaboration right uh, because yeah um yeah i i think that uh that's um that's it, it is a really difficult question and um, yeah, like it's it's really hard not to despair um, at this moment. But um, I guess we can uh, we can always um, learn from each other and um, build these connections. Thank you, thank you. I, I guess we have other questions uh, in the chat, so I'm gonna read uh, some of them. I, we have still time. So the first question asks. Can the panelists discuss structures or institutions of transnational solidarity that are not inherently imperialist? How do we put decolonization into practice in our support? Uh, I guess this question relates uh, closely to what I was talking about. Uh, Yes, I'm pretty sure there are uh, initiatives and uh, networks um, that strive to be anti-imperialist. Um, I think that um, anti-imperialism is not some goal that we 
that we can achieve and then the work is done. <laughs> it's like a constant process of learning and people try to be anti-imperialist and to be in solidarity with each other, though it's always uneasy. So those solidarities are very uneasy, they're sporadic, uh, not often structures or institutions. Um, I don't think that institutions, if you mean, for example, international organizations can be anti-imperialistic because they depend a lot on the funding, uh, donors, etc. But grassroots initiatives can be, and they are, uh, just a question of uh, learning about them and learning from them. So I hope that answers. Thank you, Tatiana. Anyone wants to answer or have thoughts on that? Okay, I'm going to go to them. To another question, um, another question we specifically uh, have for Mahira. So Violeta asking, uh, she was late for start of your speaking. Please clarify your thesis with reference to author regarding war between hemophilic West and homophobic East. Not only societies are heterogenic, but the same Russian government and official think tanks, intellectuals are consistent of LGB people. Those Putin servants in RF, Russian Federation, academia, industry are for his, uh, I cannot, uh, SMO. If you can clarify what SMO means, I will gladly appreciate, as well due to their activities. So they, basically to clarify your thesis between homophobic West and homophobic East, because society is heterogeneous per se. Yeah, uh, this was exactly the point uh, I was making, and I was referring to um, the um, terminology used by uh, Lori Essig and Alexander Kandakov, um, who criticized this um, juxtaposition, yeah, this discourse uh, that exists. And this is exactly also what I um, think that, uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, it's it's a, a binary that doesn't stand to the test of reality in any way. So I completely <laughs> agree. And yeah, um, sorry if I didn't make my point more clearly. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Mahira. Another question we have, I guess, for everyone, whoever wants to answer. What are the relations between queer movements and opposition movements in the countries you focus on? And what concrete recommendations will you have in overcoming authoritarianism in Belarus, the South Caucasus, and Central Asia? Shota, yeah. Uh, yeah. Very quick observation. I, I think it's super important to have your own agenda and like push and like take whatever you need from liberal groups, but also have a space to choose what you want, how you want to be done and not being represented by them, basically. Um, like a very quick example um, against overlying on uh, liberal groups. For instance, in Georgia, one of the most uh, like queer friendly uh, libertarian actually uh, party um, is Girchi and like they're very open to their queer members they're, they seem safe and they're super outspoken against Georgian Orthodox Church which is like one of the main sources of uh, homophobia in Georgia but when the when the government government recently proposed to um, legislate uh, against um, LGBT so-called LGBT propaganda now, they even doubled down, um, like even last year, uh, saying that, you know, gender should be entirely scrapped from le Georgian legislation, from every law, because it's, it's a weird uh, concept that we ideologically don't accept. So uh, my advice would be accept anything from li liberal groups and don't be too naive, uh, don't... don't I mean, there are no perfect allies, but some allies may end up being quite problematic when it comes to social security, social benefits, housing, a lot of stuff that do, uh, has to do with social justice. You may find that the liberal groups are quite an awkward allies, unfortunately. That's my comment. Thank you, Shota. Any, Janar? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could add that with nationalist group, it's um, very hard to find a common ground because they are very male dominated. And we saw some examples in Kazakhstan, how they actually used the very famous, um, how to say, speaking women, woman heads, as to say. But in the end, this woman were left. So it's a big lesson, again, to everybody that 
patriarchal nationalist groups even they say something on on we on the ground we could you know a little bit unite i mean for example they speaking about uh, of course let's uh, divide more from uh, russian influence or you know uh, that kind of practices yes we do agree but the preliminary like you know very very male dominated and it's very hard to put even one voice inside of this group because of what they speak is uh, uh, male prism it's patriarchy patriarchal prism to the world to the to the activism itself so for us it's very hard uh, you know to come to them in even have discussion because you will not hear your voice so that is why it's difficult about the second part of authoritarian regime uh, we think uh, as feminita i will speak only on behalf of feminita that women should uh, you know demand uh, demand more than now because uh, we are not still represented in the state affairs and uh, actually uh, go and vote every time because we lose this opportunity and that is why there are a lot of false statistics happening we have to vote monitor the votes not just do the revolution because we saw the results of revolution some person in the jail come to the presidency you know and uh, you do not know this person and this person then becomes to be a big friend of committee of national security uh they are like two head dragon now in kyrgyzstan i'm speaking on the case of kyrgyzstan so we have to do maybe this revolution like through the methods that we could use like voting uh that is why for example i ran election for maslika to show the example maybe how we can solidarize and unite uh, around this uh, process uh and also demand the the <clears throat> the concept itself of reproductive right we are speaking to young women now to young girls and saying do we actually need to bring a child to birth, give a birth to child we have to ask ourselves do we need like you know uh, we start in the discussion is it necessary to every woman in kazakhstan to bring a child uh, i know i maybe now sound a little bit like too sharp but we try to speak it like and discuss it uh, so everybody can say their opinion because it seems that we have to demand something that nobody could then say oh you cannot do that yes we can we can not to bring children to the authoritarian regime and how would this regime would stand without sorry without people <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Janar. Uh, I guess you touched a very important point and the question. Um, sorry if I rained on somebody's parade, but recent development in Russia with the death of Navalny, I will say that personally I'm very divided about him because he never brought up LGBTQ plus or women's issues, right? So he was nationalistic and that's why we mortify the person who does not even or did not. He, of course, he uh, empowered a lot of young people to go and protest, but they do not include the important topics. The same with uh, the, within the United States, what I'm observing right now, that uh, women's rights of abortions, right, or trans rights usually are not on the agenda of cisgender, gay, white, populated male uh, activists. And it's very uh, hard, disheartening because they say, oh, at least we have same-sex marriage, we can get married, right? But what about other uh, if they take that right from trans uh, person to play sport or from the person who can give birth, it could be you next time. That's what people, I guess, do not realize and really appreciate your point on that. Uh, so there is another uh, question for Violet, from Violet. I, sorry, I, I'm going to read because uh, Janar, um, uh, she's uh, thanking you for including critical perspective. What is your opinion regarding not only businessmen at gay clubs, but about academicians or academics who receive careers benefits without help to gr grassroots uh, gr groups? Do you know such terms as grant eaters, grant tayede, or cases of creating hoax stories about repression in order to receive status of queer refugee in uh, Ireland or other countries? Uh, yeah, what we do not do in Feminita, we do not help with the affirmation letters. Uh, there are a lot of requests to Feminita to prove that letters. We do not prove it to lesbians, to bisexual, queer, or any any person. Uh, we do sorry, but we work for our land, for the Kazakhstan, where we do live now. I'm just now in New York. 
but uh, I, I am from Kazakhstan and I do work in Kazakhstan. And I want to kiss women in Kazakhstan and I want to flirt with her in Kazakhstan, for example. Exceptionally, the that forums that Mohira said, I flirted also in Georgia. So that means we work there in our land, in our country, and we would like to help people in the uh, country context. Um, so I, <clears throat> if it is a choice of a person, uh, academicians, to go, uh, you know, and benefit from the researches on us, I mean, yeah, it's probably happening. Yeah, we see a lot of researches coming from from the west to to east <laughs> to Central Asia, but we also question them: Why are you doing this research? Uh, did you include uh, some kind of you know decolonial approach? Uh, how we benefit from this research after? So um, yeah, we sometimes we just do not agree to participate in that kind of service uh, service, or we do not uh, agree to give interview. This is our choice too. But we cannot uh, also stop people go to academia and uh, be academician there. Well, we have to uh, we have to fight on. I mean, we as lesbians, myself as lesbian, I, I didn't go to academia exactly because I'm so busy in grassroots activism. I'm sorry to say, I'm very busy on the ground, and um, maybe I could be used in academia. But in academia, I also should fight with the institutional uh, hierarchy. So I chose my uh, struggle on the ground, where I see streets, when I see people, not the uh, invisible uh, challenges that in academia could be a little bit more hidden rather than at streets. Um, if I may also respond to, I don't know what the specific context uh, uh, that the question refers to in Kazakhstan is, but... Um, being an academic and um, this is my day job this is um, how I earn my living uh, I also wouldn't say that I, I extract huge benefits from uh, being involved in activism or raising the topics that I cover in my research on the contrary it's hindered my career in significant ways so um, if you do research on uh, topics of gender and sexuality and activism and feminism in Central Asia. Um, this is also a type of activism, right? So we shouldn't, again, you know, uh, reduce ourselves to this kind of binary thinking. Um, so we should mm, do activism wherever we are, in whichever field we're engaged in, politicizing our own environments that we find ourselves in, um, our own lives and experiences. So, yeah. And also, like, you know, asylum seekers, um, uh, I think it's also kind of a trivializing and devaluing um, um, approach when you say that somebody is um, making things up, you, you, you don't know the full story of a person's life. So if uh, it's a really hard path to go, yeah, seeking political go asylum in, a, in, a, in another country and if a, a person decided they want to do it, especially by associating themselves with a stigmatized identity, I think, yeah, we shouldn't um, be very quick to make, uh, yeah, judgments there, so. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's complicated, believe me, uh, working in the United States with a lot of asylum seekers is definitely, and being myself, political asylum, it's, uh, different journeys and um i guess people as you write and what what i wanted to uh, also ask and maybe you kind of i don't know if you connected to any of your uh communities abroad like um if people who uh, left your countries do they somehow connect to you do they provide any i don't know support or trying to uh educate community outside of your countries or you have not developed the connections with the communities uh, or diaspora abroad with the queer particular diaspora. Show that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the result is like this queer drain and mig mass migration. Uh, and ironically, a lot of Georgians also uh, um, like uh, 
it's it's anecdotal, but uh, reportedly claimed to be um, queer refugees just to get uh, in, in into the Western countries for economic reasons, uh, which is also tragic. Uh, so this is, uh, as much as I know, there are two big trends. Um, the fact that they face racism um, in host uh, countries, Georgian queer migrants, so you go uh, you go through the hell and then you have to tackle with uh, you know secondary victimization um not being accepted not being welcomed nobody loves refugees that's the sentiment that they're getting and also getting sometimes terrible treatment uh, like being like from Georgians there and but uh, what I'm really fascinated is that queer Georgians in, in Europe mostly They've been starting to, I don't know, let's call it educating or campaigning or advocating for their rights. And uh, they've been on TikTok, they've been on the Reels, and uh, they've been on social media and Facebook. And I think it matters because what Georgians lacked is to see a specific person who is queer and who is Georgian. And we've basically been lacking that. So right now, they have a strong element of uh, queer advocacy in Georgia. And I mean, for Georgians, so I, I'm really fascinated by their uh, by the commitment to Georgia, despite having to go through a lot of uh, troubles. Yeah. Thank you, Shota. Any other? I, I mm -hmm. that, that, yeah, sometimes I um, meet with the Kazakhstani uh, ex Kazakhstani citizens who live now in the US, for example. But what I feel usually at that meeting is they feel uh, some kind of guilty, um, that they're guilty that they leave uh, the country. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm trying not to, like, you know, to develop that uh, feeling. I try to speak uh, about everything they want to, just to share experience, uh, saying how the situation in Kazakhstan with LGBT right now. But what I feel is usually uh, they feel guilty and then, um, Maybe, I don't know, some kind of, maybe even they say we will return if time changes and, and so on. So for me, it's, um, I feel they still like, you know, would like to be in the, in the communication groups or uh, know what is happening. And they try, try to, to know or to invite you to have tea or coffee. But uh, yeah, but I cannot say that we do something with them as a project or we do not publish any, you know, some kind of articles together. Um, if it would happen, of course, I would be happy and open. But usually it's a little bit feeling that they try to uh, maybe, um, how to say, to forget uh, what happened in Kazakhstan. And that's why for them it's uh, not easy to speak uh, or meet me. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Janar. I, I think we have a couple minutes, like two minutes left. If anyone wants to add any uh, final thoughts, it will be greatly appreciated or we can just wrap it up. But I think it was great uh, for us to be in this space because it's not very often happening and I'm very uh, gra grateful to Davis Center for that. So do you have any final thoughts or we can uh, pass it along to Chris? Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, I hope we can uh, meet somewhere in the crossroads of the cosmopolitan world. <laughs> so join me in thanking our speakers today, uh, Shota, Mohira, Janar, Katsiana, and of course, Leosha for shepherding this important conversation. And thanks to you, our audience, for being here. As a reminder, please consider attending our upcoming and final session, which will be held next Friday, March 22nd, same time, 11 a.m. Eastern. That conversation will build on today's sessions and the previous sessions, and will look specifically at queer studies in Ukraine. So thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you on the 22nd. Have a great day. Thank you.